I really didn't want other people living in our house. I had barely recovered from my mom's death. The idea of having to share my house with complete strangers sounded awful. But dad made it clear that mom's medical bills had added up. He promised he would make sure that our new housemates would be easy to live with. It won't be so bad, he said. We never used those guest rooms anyway. You probably won't even notice. Everything will be fine, Mary. I promise. There were only two candidates that matched my dad's lofty standards. A mother and a son, Alexis and Jack. Alexis was a recent divorcee. She worked as a secretary for the mayor. Despite working for the most powerful man in town, her paycheck wasn't great, thus her need for cheap living. My dad was happy to provide her with some, in return for an extra $200 a month. My dad introduced me to the couple days before they were set to move in. We met at a little diner downtown. I think my dad thought that I would take it better if we met somewhere outside of the house. Alexis was pretty short. Her son, in contrast, was very tall. He was just a few inches shorter than my dad. I felt a vague sense of familiarity when I first saw him. I don't know if he felt the same way. He was looking down at the ground, a sour expression on his face. Alexis gave me a friendly smile and a warm handshake. She was nice enough, but Jack just gave me a quick hey and then he never looked at me again. They moved in soon after. At first, my dad was right. Alexis was gone for most of the day, and often returned after I had already went to bed. Jack mostly stayed in his room, watching TV or playing video games. Other than the sound of the television and a few encounters in the kitchen or hall, he acted like a ghost more than a housemate. That didn't last forever, though. Jack and I went to the same high school. I proudly had seen him in the hallways before I had even met him. For the next month or so, it was pretty awkward. Jack and I would eat breakfast in silence, and then we would get on the bus. I would listen to music on my phone while Jack would chat with his friends. Other than that, everything was going fairly well at school. I even made the girls' soccer team. As bad as it may sound, part of the reason I was so happy to be on the team was to get away from home. Since both Alexis and my dad worked during the day, Jack and I would be left alone in the house. Jack still barely talked to me. When he got home, he went into his room and only went out for food. There is almost something unsettling about being so distant from somebody that you live with. But still, it wasn't that bad. The beginning of the end started in spring. The worst part is, I didn't realize it until later, after the damage had already been done. I came home from soccer practice to find Jack on the couch, looking at his laptop. Hey, I said. Oh, it's you. His eyes stayed glued on his laptop. I made a token effort of conversation. What are you looking at? You know how I take forensic science as an elective. Well, now I have to do a report on a serial killer for it. I think I'm going to pick Jack the Ripper. Why? Because you guys share a name? Okay, maybe that was a dumb question, but I didn't know what else to say. Jack may have been a bit more introverted than I was, but I'm far from a social butterfly myself. Jack snorted. No, it's because he's the coolest. The coolest? Yeah. He never got caught, even after sending letters to the police. Jack seemed to be getting more animated the longer he talked. Plus, he's the most famous. Oh, okay. I began to walk up the stairs to go to my room. Good luck, I guess. I found it a bit strange that he found a serial killer cool, but it didn't seem too weird. I mean, people love horror movie villains, like Michael Myers or Freddy Krueger. Sure, Jack the Ripper had been real, but it had been over a century since he had committed those crimes. 
combined with a ton of movies about her, including Emma, Jack the Ripper might as well have been fictional. After a few months of living with Jack and Alexis, I started to notice things. Like how Alexis and Jack never really talked to each other. Unless it was Alexis telling Jack to do something or Jack asking for something, it was total radio silence. Alexis talked to me and my dad more than she talked to her own son. Jack didn't really talk to anybody in the house at all. Little did I know their problems ran much deeper than I thought. Their relationship came to a head one night. I was doing my homework in my bedroom when I heard yelling coming from Alexis's room. It's your fault. I heard a voice yell. I was fairly certain that it was Jack's. That's not true and you know it. A more feminine voice yelled back. I assumed that it was Alexis, but I had never heard her sounding so angry. You can't keep blaming me for your problems. How is it my fault that your grades are down? I wanted to live with Dad, but you wouldn't let me. Jack's voice was getting angrier. If you would just let me, I wouldn't be your problem. Jack, your dad didn't want you to live with him. Alexis screamed. He didn't want you. The silence that followed spoke volumes. After a moment, it was broken by the sound of a door being opened and then slammed shut. I could hear Jack nearly running to his room and roughly closing the door. With some hesitation, I decided to leave my room. Jack's bedroom door was unsurprisingly closed. I wanted to talk to him, but I was afraid I would become a target for his anger. So I went and I knocked on Alexis's door. Miss Finnerman? I asked softly. Alexis opened the door. Her face was red and her eyes were puffy. It was obvious that she had been crying. Hello, Mary. Alexis said in a shaky voice. I'm so sorry if we bothered you. It's okay. I said quickly. But it did sound pretty bad. Maybe you should, um, talk to Jack. There are a few things more awkward than being 14 and trying to give parental advice to a grown adult. No, no. Alexis responded. Jack will get over it. Everything will be fine. Good night. She shut the door. It seemed pretty damn far from fine to me. And I think Alexis knew that deep down too. I really wish that she had tried to fix things. Who knows? It might have stopped Jack from changing. I didn't see Alexis and Jack talk to each other after that. Jack became much more easily agitated, snapping at people for any reason. I started to dread coming home. About a month after Jack and Alexis' fight, I got home to find Jack sitting on the couch once again. Instead of looking at his laptop, Jack was reading a book. The book was thick, with the silhouette of a man in Victoria-era clothing with a knife in his hand on the cover. The title read, The Butcher of Whitechapel. I wasn't an expert on Jack the Ripper or anything, but I knew enough to realize that that book was about him. I didn't want to talk that much because I was afraid he would take his anger out on me. However, my curiosity got the better of me. You're still working on your project? No. Jack said sharply. I finished it weeks ago. I'm reading this because I want to. He said the last part like that made him superior somehow. Oh. I responded. But isn't that kind of morbid? It isn't morbid. Jack's tone was defensive. It's about one man who saw how bad his city was, and he did something about it, and he got away with it. This gave me pause. Um, you do know that something he did was kill people, right? Jack rolled his eyes. They were just hookers. It's not like any of them mattered. Reading about true crime. Sure, why not? Getting really interested in one case in particular. Perfectly fine. 
and describing a serial killer like a superhero and saying his victims didn't matter. And that's messed up. While the woman Jack the Ripper killed probably weren't saints, and they didn't deserve to be brutally murdered. It must have been so horrible. Dying alone, terrified and in pain. It left an awful taste in my mouth to hear him gloss over something like that. I could have argued with him over it, and maybe I should have. But I was tired and I didn't feel like getting into a fight about a long dead serial killer. And more that, I was starting to get a little freaked out by the weird case of serial killer hero worship Jack had. Whatever. I simply sat and I went up to my room. While unsettling, Jack's behavior was easy enough to ignore. I just avoided him more often. And Jack was honestly making it easier for me. In the mornings after my dad and Alexis had left for work, he would return to his bedroom and miss school. How he got away with this for so long was baffling to me. However, considering Alexis was a less than attentive parent, I guess it might have been easier than I thought. The next big incident happened a couple of weeks later. I was eating an after school snack when Jack came rushing down the stairs. He immediately went to the mailbox. Jack shifted through the envelopes, and when he couldn't find what he was looking for, he carelessly shoved the mail back into the box. Jack called to me from the door. Did my mom touch the mail? He sounded breathless. This was the most animated that I had seen him in days. No, I said. What's the big deal? Jack cursed under his breath and he kicked the couch. It's my birthday. My dad promised you would send a card to me. Maybe it just got lost in the mail. I said. Happy birthday. I added awkwardly. Jack didn't respond. He went up to his room without another word. I shrugged. I felt a little bad for him, but Jack probably didn't want my sympathy. The next day, I came home after my last soccer practice of the year. Jack was in the kitchen, sitting at the table and holding his cell phone up to his ear. His leg was bouncing and he seemed very antsy. Jack didn't notice me come in. I decided that it was best just to go up to my room. I was halfway up the stairs when Jack started talking to someone on his phone. Dad! Jack greeted. His voice lit up with happiness. It was silent for a couple seconds before Jack said, Oh, okay, no, it, really, it's fine. All the joy had left his voice. I get it. It's been busy. Bye. Jack didn't say anything for a while. I thought that he was going to cry. And then a loud bang rang through the air. I jumped a bit. Jack cursed loudly again and again. I hurried up to my room as fast as I could. When my dad came home, I told him about the incident. I also made it clear how much Jack was making me uncomfortable. And dad talked to Alexis later that night. I'm so, so sorry. Alexis apologized. Jack has been having a tough time with the divorce. I promise. I'll make sure that he won't do it again. Alexis must have talked with Jack because he avoided me like the plague. Whenever I walked into a room, he would leave it. Sometimes Jack would shoot me a nasty look before he left. I didn't really care as long as he didn't bother me. It was around this time I noticed Jack going into the basement more and more often. And to be frank, our basement was crappy. It was small and musty and dark. The only thing we used it for was Halloween and Christmas decorations. Jack seemed to like it though. I would see him disappear down the stairs for hours at a time. When I got home from school, Jack would be missing. He wouldn't reappear until the night came. And then the smell started. It wasn't a bad smell, mind you. It actually was fairly pleasant at first. Just the faint smell of air freshener by the stairs. However, it got more noticeable until the entire house was full of the scent. 
I had enough of it and I fully confronted Jack about it. What's with you and the air freshener? Our entire house smells like a Febreze factory. How do you know it was me? I know it wasn't me. My dad and your mom claim they're not doing it either. So unless the house is haunted, you're the only one left. Who knows? Jack scoffed. Maybe your mom got tired of the graveyard and came back here. I was shot into silence for a moment. That's not funny. I growled after recovering. Jack rolled his eyes. To you, sure. But to me, it's pretty damn funny. I could see he was enjoying my distress. I'm going to tell my dad what you said. I yelled. And? He's not going to kick me out. And not when my mom's still paying to live here. As much as I hated to admit it, he had me there. With the hospital bills, my dad had to work long hours just to make ends meet. He came home exhausted every day. The extra $200 really did help. While my dad did step in before when Jack's behavior became violent, he wouldn't care about overuse of air freshener. The comments about my mom might have gotten his attention, but I didn't want to risk him having to deal with even more stress. I stormed off and I went into my room. My dislike of Jack was growing by the day. It was even worse than school was ending soon. With our parents gone and neither of us having a job, me and Jack were going to be in the house alone for most of the days. Jack made it clear he didn't want me in the house. While he acted civil when our parents were around, he taunted me as much as he could in private. If it wasn't that, it was rock music turned up so loud that it could make your ears bleed. Jack would laugh whenever I told him to turn it down. I hated it so much. I hated him so much. I took any reason to get out of that house. I found ways to keep busy. I would hang out with my friends as much as possible. I tried to help out my neighbors. One week was spent trying to find old Mrs. Lopez's cat. It was an outdoor cat, so Mrs. Lopez never really worried about her. But her cat went missing for a week. And nearly the whole neighborhood was searching for the cat. But sadly, it was nowhere to be found. The only time Jack was quiet when our parents were out was when he went down to the basement. One day as I was passing the staircase, I thought I heard a squeaky noise coming from the basement. I asked Jack about it. I was trying to fix it up. Jack said, It's barren down there. Then why do you keep going down to the basement? I thought to myself. I didn't voice my question though. I was tired of Jack and all of his crap. I didn't want to have to argue with him. And plus every minute he was down in the basement was one less minute of stress for me. Soon the summer came to an end. School would start and I would have entire days without Jack. It might have been the first time I was happy the summer was ending. I didn't know if Jack was going to go back at all, but I got my answer the morning of the first day of school. I was eating breakfast when Jack came down from his room. He had his notebook in his hand. I had often seen him carried into the basement with him. I figured that it was a journal or something. You're actually coming to school? I asked. Jack scoffed. No, I just need to ask you something. Do you know Hannah Smith's number? No, why would I? I knew of Hannah Smith. She had a rather unsavory reputation due to her habit of being loose, if you catch my drift. There were even rumors that she had boys pay her for sex. Not only had I never talked to Hannah before, we weren't even in the same grade. You're both girls, Jack said. And? Jack just stared at me like I was supposed to understand. When I realized that that was his only reasoning, I decided I wasn't going to dignify with the response. Whatever. Jack sat down on the couch, setting his notebook on it. I'll just get her number from someone else. From who? I hadn't seen Jack hang out with any of his friends since he stopped going to school. Joe, we talk online. He's the one who's covering for me. 
with school? So that's how you've gotten away with dropping out. Jack glared at me. I haven't dropped out. I still do the work. And the fake doctor's notes help. Besides, it's not like my dear mother would notice. Jack said the last part with a sardonic tone. Something about this conversation was unsettling to me. This was the least hostile conversation we had had in months. But that was the thing. Even before Jack became wraithful and cruel, he was always jumpy and sullen. He seemed too calm. Why are you in such a good mood? I asked, suspicious. I'm finally going to start a project I've been working towards for most of the year. Jack was so cheerful. It was like he was an entirely different person. I noticed how he avoided telling me what his project was. And it's about... I trailed off, hoping he would answer. Jack actually laughed. Oh, you'll find out. Soon enough. Trust me, no one is going to forget. There was a light in his eyes that I didn't like. I looked at the clock to find an excuse to leave the house. It turns out that the bus was coming in less than five minutes. I turned and I rushed towards the living room. I grabbed the school supplies that I had forgotten to be in my bag and I crammed them in there without much thought. After I had gotten everything, I opened the door. I looked back into the living room to see if I had missed anything. Jack was staring at me, unblinking, like he was contemplating something. What? I demanded. Jack finally blinked. He gave an almost eerie, serene smile. It's nothing. I have fun at school. It sounded like he was telling a joke that he only knew the punchline for her. Thoroughly creeped out, I left without another word. I just managed to catch the bus. I wanted to go to school and forget all about Jack's strange behavior, but that wasn't in the cards. I was in English class when I pulled out what I thought was my notebook. It was only then that I realized that it was Jack's. I must have accidentally grabbed his by mistake. I have to admit, I was curious. Jack had gone from an awkward housemate to an enemy to an enigma within a year. A morbid sense of wonder pushed me onwards. While my teacher talked, I began to read it. It started out normal. The math problems littered the first pages. I guess that's what he used the notebook for at first. And halfway through, names started popping up. Jack the Resurrection, Jack Returns, Return of the Ripper. I giggled just a little. Sure, his obsession was still creepy, but the names themselves were so ridiculous. Plus, tons of teenagers go through that edgy phase. Maybe I was just overthinking things, I thought. And then I saw the notes. It's a lot harder than I thought it would be. But still, the rush was amazing. I already knew why Jack did it, but now I know why he kept at it. Knock them out before you start. Way less work. The cons. Mom and the other two might find out. They'll smell. No real reason to keep them. The pros. I did it. Getting rid of them would be like throwing away gold medals. It's the only proof that I'm not dreaming. I read them again and again. It wasn't that it didn't make sense. The problem was that it made too much sense. Jack's antisocial behavior. His obsession with Jack the Ripper. Always trying to get me out of the house. Spending hours in the basement where no one else went. It was like solving a puzzle I didn't know I was working on. No. I told myself. He couldn't have done anything. He's just a teenager. And me or dad or Alexis would have noticed. You've seen tons of stories on the news of teens killing other people. A voice in my head countered. And the only other person in the house most of the time was you. I remembered all the times I had realized Jack's behavior was strange, but I didn't say or do anything. I suddenly felt sick. With shaking hands, I flipped to the last page, 
to see if maybe he had changed it or if this was some kind of prank he was pulling on me. And there was one last line that scared me the most. I'm ready. Jack the Ripper has been reborn. Let the games begin. I should have told somebody about what I had read, but doubt still nagged at me. If I was wrong, I could ruin his life. Instead, I made a plan of action. I would wait until my dad got home from work, and then I would show him the notebook and he would confront Jack. The problem was, my dad got home around 9. I decided I would go home, lock myself in my room and wait. I was extremely nervous about being home alone with Jack, but it was the only plan my panicked mind could come up with. After my bus dropped me off, I walked to my house, dread weighing me down like a ball and chain. Before I opened the door, I looked into the windows. I couldn't see Jack. I took a deep breath and I opened the front door. I didn't go in at first. I simply looked inside. I almost called out to see if Jack was there, but then I realized how dumb that was. If he had noticed that I had taken his notebook, he would at least be angry with me. Given what he had written, I was worried about what Jack was capable of. Cautiously, I made my way into the house. Jack seemed to be gone. Where he went, I didn't know. I was afraid he was hiding, waiting for the right time to ambush me. I was halfway to the stairs when I caught sight of the kitchen. A thought came to me. This might be my only chance to see what's in the basement. Not exactly a smart idea. For all I knew, Jack could be down there. But still, it was too tempting to pass up. I could confirm or disprove my greatest fear. I went into the kitchen and I walked to the basement stairs. I stared at the bottom, trying to gather enough courage to go down. With some hesitation, I went down the stairs. The sick, sweet artificial smell filled the large room. A small window provided light, although it wasn't much. In the dim light, I could see that Jack had tacked on drawings of the Ripper on all the walls. In between them were news articles. Even though I could only make out the headlines, I could guess what they were about without reading them. He must have printed them out himself. One section of the wall was slightly different than the others. It was above a table where my dad used to fix stuff up. There were black and white photos of dead women. Their faces weren't peaceful in death, but instead looked to still be in pain. One looked less of a person and more like a pile of meat, her skin torn off. These had to be the crime scene photos of the Ripper's victims. Underneath the grisly pictures were letters. Jack mentioned the serial killer had written letters during his crime spree. Both were signed by Jack the Ripper. Sentences were underlined that Jack had been studying them. One line in particular got my attention. You will soon hear from me with my funny little games. Is that what Jack thought this was? A game? If it was, I certainly wasn't having any fun. Upon further inspection of the table, there were strange stains on it. I wanted to run from the basement, hell, run from the house, and never come back. Ignoring that fear, I went to investigate the boxes that had stacked in the corner of the basement. Behind the stack, I discovered a pile of our Christmas decorations, and decorations that were supposed to be in one of the boxes. I became aware of something that I had overlooked before. While the air freshener was overpowering, there was an undercurrent of a much nastier smell. The scent seemed to be coming from a box placed near the top of the pile. I picked it up. It was heavier than it should have been. I placed it carefully on the ground. I didn't want to open it. I was scared of what I might find. But I had let too many things go for far too long. I had to know. I tore off the lid like I was tearing off a band-aid. I'm not going to describe what I saw in detail. I don't think I could. But I will tell you that the box was the makeshift grave for small animals. 
I could even make out the brown fur of Mrs. Lopez's missing cat. I can also tell you that it was clear that Jack had been taking inspiration from the crime scene photos that he had been doing for a fairly long time. I let go of the box and I got as far away from it as I could in the basement. After I calmed down at least a bit, I reached for my phone. I dialed my dad's number. When I went to voicemail, I tried again and again. Come on, come on, I begged. Please pick up, please. I nearly cried when my dad finally answered. Mary, what's wrong? I'm, I'm in the basement, I said. I found a box and it, it's filled with dead animals. I think Jack killed them. What? I could hear the disbelief in my dad's voice. I know it sounds crazy, but trust me. I said. Jack has this thing with Jack the Ripper. And, and. My panic had caught up to me. It was getting hard to breathe and my primal instincts were screaming at me to run. Dad, I'm so scared. My dad seemed to understand how frightened I was. Mary, is Jack in the house? I don't think so. I need you to get out of the house right now. I'll call the police and come home as soon as I can. Just stay safe. Okay. I said. I hung up and I started to climb up the stairs. And then I heard it. Footsteps. I stopped dead in my tracks. It sounded like two people were above me. I held my breath. So, where do you want to start? A girl asked flirtatiously. It was hard to hear from down in the basement, but I was fairly certain I didn't recognize the voice. Well, I was thinking maybe in the woods. My blood ran cold. It was Jack. Jack was in the house and could come down to the basement at any time. As quietly as I could, I got off the stairs and I moved to the corner of my room. If he decided to come down, I was done for her. The woods? You're kidding, right? And the girl asked. My landlord's daughter might be home, but that shouldn't matter. I'm the one paying you. You do what I say. Jack declared. I could see just a hint of nervousness in his voice. I became even more worried myself. I realized that the girl was probably Hannah Smith. I don't need the money that badly. Hannah scoffed. No. I thought, don't make him angry. She was oblivious of how much danger she was in, and I had to listen to it, dreading what might be coming. Shut up, Jack yelled. You're not ruining this for me. Jesus, what's wrong with you? Anna said. Keep the money, I'm out of here. No, Jack yelled. And then Hannah screamed out. I heard her hit the ground. Why? Anna's voice was laced with pain, fear, and confusion. I couldn't take it. I ran up the stairs. Jack stared at me in shock when I came up. Anna was on the floor, covering a bloody wound on her side. While Jack was distracted, I tackled him. Run! I yelled to Hannah. She quickly crawled out the door. Before I saw her go, Jack overpowered me. You stupid! Jack snarled at me. I was pinned to the ground and I pressed against my neck. His eyes were wild. I called the police. I choked out. I could feel Hannah's still warm blood drip down my throat from the knife. Do you know how long I had prepared for this? Jack seethed. He roughly shook me like a rag doll. I planned it all out and you ruined it. I was going to be the next Jack the Ripper. Everybody was going to remember me. And then you... He suddenly stopped. Mary. Jack said my name like it was a revelation. Mary like Mary Nichols. Mary like Mary Kelly. A grin cut across his face as a low laugh rose from Jack's throat. What? What does that mean? I demanded. Mary Ann Nichols. The first victim. Mary Jane Kelly, the last, 
It's destiny. I can't believe I didn't see it before. Jack's smile was wide, but his eyes were desperate. I realized what he was planning. No, no! I struggled as hard as I could. Jack was too strong, though. He pushed me down with strength I didn't know he had. Do you know what Jack did to Mary Kelly? He asked it like I was a small child. He skinned her. It was his grand finale. Please, Jack, don't do this. I begged. He ignored my pleas. I might not be able to get as many as Jack, but the one I do get, I'll make sure they'll remember. Mom and Dad will never forget. I'll be a legend. I don't think he was even aware of me talking at that point. Jack raised his knife and cut into the side of my face. I screamed in pain as he dragged the knife down. I looked into Jack's face. The last thing I thought I was ever going to see. His eyes were wide open, excited, and his grin was large enough to show all of his teeth. I couldn't see the boy that I had met at that dinner. All I could see was the monster that he had become. Mary! At first, I thought I had imagined my dad's voice. And then I saw my dad grab Jack off of me. Jack slashed wildly at him, but my dad managed to take the knife away from him. A second later, the police poured into the kitchen. After they had secured Jack, my dad raced over to me. Before that point, I had been numb with shock and pain. I could barely even process what I was seeing. But as soon as my dad pulled me into his arms, I broke down. I cried while my dad held me close. Hannah had lived. A neighbor of mine had gone to help her a minute before my dad had gotten home. I still keep in touch with her. I'm glad I was able to help her. It also made a selfish, bitter part of myself happy. It felt like I had beaten Jack. But I guess he won. Alexis left town not soon after begging for my forgiveness, even though she didn't do anything. The fact she didn't do anything about Jack was the problem, though. A part of me whispered, and I tried to ignore it. I heard Jack's dad wasn't much better off. Jack got the attention he so desired. The story made national news. A true crime show even asked my father and I for an interview. My dad actually considered it since the money would pay for the plastic surgery. Jack had left a long, jagged scar down the side of my face. While I certainly don't like it, I don't want my dad to spend money on it. I always have reminders. I wake up with nightmares most nights. Nightmares where there is no rescue from Jack. Just his knife tearing my skin off. I can't even look at my old house without the images of dead animals. Photos of mutilated woman in Jack's face flashing through my mind. Jack forced me to play a game that I didn't want to play. Now I live with the fear, and he spends the next 50 years in a cell. I think we'll both be playing this game for the rest of our lives, and neither of us will ever truly win.